this practice we're engaged in, the practice of trying to put an end to suffering, is a long-term process. And it has its ups and downs. And sometimes the downs get really down. So you need something to sustain you, to keep you going, even when things get difficult, either in terms of the state of your mind, the state of the body as it gets ill, grows old, and finally winds down and dies, and the state of the situation around you. And things can get not only difficult, but sometimes outrageously, unfair, outrageously disruptive. You need something to keep you on course. That famous passage where King Basanity comes to see the Buddha in the middle of the day, and the Buddha asks him, where are you coming from? And the king is very frank, unusually frank for a politician. Say, so, oh, I've been spending my time obsessed with the things that people obsessed with power are usually obsessed with. And the Buddha gives him a, an analogy. He says, it's like four mountains coming in from all four directions, crushing everything in their path. If you were to find out that there was a mountain coming in from the east, another one from the south, another one from the west, another one from the north, reflecting on the fact that life Human life is so rare, hard to come by. What would you do? The king's answer is, no. what else could he do but to practice the Dharma? Now that's not the, the answer of someone who believes that life is just a one-shot deal. So if someone who believes that okay, there is something that lasts beyond death, and that your actions are going to determine what that something is going to be like, and also that what you do is going to make a difference in how much you're going to suffer or not suffer when those mountains come in, because the mountains, of course, represent aging, illness, and death. This is why one of the major strengths, in fact, the first of the five strengths that the Buddha lists is conviction, sata is the Pali word, sometimes translated as faith, which is one of those dirty words in Buddhist circles here in the West. Nobody likes to say faith because that's what we've run away from, and anyone with a Christian background has been taught that faith is believing in things that sometimes are very irrational. In fact, it's a virtue to believe in those things in spite of the fact that they're very unreasonable, like things like original sin. Or the way redemption is supposed to come about. None of those things make any sense, and yet the idea is that if you have strong faith in them, then that will carry you through. And so for many of us, the idea of faith is something where you have to sort of check your brain at the door, check your mind at the door, and teach yourself not to ask questions. Well, that's not what the quality of faith is in the Buddhist teachings. So we use the word conviction to show that it's different, but the sense of commitment, the sense of sustenance, sustaining power, is very similar to faith. Here the faith is in the Buddha's awakening. Now that one incident has a lot of implications. As you may remember, the Buddha's awakening consisted of three knowledges, of course, of the three watches of the night. After he brought his mind to concentration, where it was bright and malleable, he inclined to the question, is this life the only one, or have there been lives before this? 
and he found himself remembering many, many lifetimes way back. There's one place where he says many thousands of aeons, many hundreds of thousands of aeons. Knowing what he was, what his name was, what he looked like. It's interesting, the details of his memories, what he ate, his experience of pleasure and pain, and how he died. And what that knowledge showed him was that this life was not the only one, that your awareness does not depend on this body. There's a kind of awareness which is independent of the body. Even though some of the texts talk about consciousness depending on the, the meeting of a, the eye, say, and an object of the eye, or the ear and a sound. That's sensory consciousness. There are six kinds. But then the Buddha also says in some other passages that there's a consciousness that's known independently of the six sense spheres. That's the consciousness. That's the awareness which is seen at awakening. So not everything depends on this body or this brain or these nerves. There's a consciousness that can go. The being goes from one life to the next on the sustenance of craving. The image the Buddha gives is of a fire that goes from one house to another. He says it goes, the fire leaps from one house to the next based on the wind, based on the air. That's its sustenance. And as to what this being is, though, the Buddha doesn't answer the question aside from that a being is determined by clinging. You define what you are by what you cling to. And when you finally let go of clinging, then you're totally undefined. But there is an awareness. It's called awareness without feature, awareness without surface. But the important thing is that your awareness doesn't depend on the function of the body. And that's an important point to take as a working hypothesis as we practice. Because otherwise, think of how much you would struggle to keep this body alive at all costs. If you felt that when the body died, that was it, everything would go out like a smashed light bulb, no, no light at all. Or how you would face death, say there was a lot of pain. You'd want to have the doctor come and shoot you full of morphine, shoot you full of all kinds of drugs so you could go out without pain in a total fog. And even just believing that consciousness survives death, you might want to go out in a total fog too. But then there's a second knowledge that the Buddha had, which is the knowledge of how all beings die and are reborn. In this case, there was a new wrinkle in that they were reborn in line with their actions which were based on their views. The quality of the action determined the quality of the rebirth. The underlying principle here is that our actions do make a difference. We do have choices. Our actions are not determined, say, by the stars or by some outside gods or just impersonal fate. We do really make choices, and we are responsible for our choices. So the lesson here is that we have to be heedful in what we choose to do, what we choose to say, what we choose to think. We have to be heedful about our views. How do we understand things? If we believe that action is unimportant or action is non-existent or that it's totally determined, We're going to be very casual and careless in how we act. But if we believe that our actions do make a real difference, we have to be very careful. So that's the message of the second knowledge. The message of the third is two things. One is that 
your experience of suffering here in the present moment is a result of two things, actions in the past combined with actions in the present, actions here including actions of the mind. There's an element of intention in how you experience form, feeling, perception, the process of fabrication and your sensory consciousness. So it's not just that you're experiencing a given that's been provided by the past, but you're actually shaping it here and now. And on top of that, it's possible to shape it in such a way that there is no suffering. There is no clinging. And because there's no clinging, you stop defining yourself. When there's no definition of you as a person, then there's no rebirth. It opens up large range of possibilities of what you can do in the present moment, even when things are bad, when you're ill, when you're dying. It's still possible not to suffer from being ill, from being old, from dying. But it requires training. So these are some of the things that, some of the implications of the Buddha's awakening. And having faith in the Buddha's awakening doesn't just mean, okay, I believe that it happened. But you also realize that it does have implications for how you live. It gives you working hypotheses for the practice. Because instead of asking you to believe something that's irrational or illogical, the Buddha is simply telling you, okay, there are these principles that can't be proven until you've actually applied them. You put them to the empirical test. If you follow these things, if you hold by them as working hypotheses, you find yourself able to free yourself from suffering. Because the question of whether there is a consciousness separate from the body. Now, that's not totally dependent on the body. That's one of the things you can't prove one way or the other. There are scientists who say, well, they haven't seen any consciousness, so they, they assume that everything that we're conscious of ha has to depend on the functioning of the brain. But that's just an assumption. The same with the assumption about whether we have free will, whether we actually do make choices and they do make a difference in our lives. There's no way you can absolutely prove it, but there's no way you can disprove it either. And the question of whether we have the ability to shape our present experience. You can't really prove it until you've seen that you, you can shape it to the point where you can put an end to any input in the present moment, see what happens then, and seeing what opens up as a result of that, and what the implications are, what the results of being able to do that are. So it's something you can't really know until you've gained full awakening. But you can apply these principles in your practice. For example, when there's pain in the body, or there's a destructive emotion in the mind, you can just sit with it and suffer from it, but you don't have to. And so you work with that possibility. What, what would it be like if you didn't have to suffer from these things? What would that mean? How would you go about that? That becomes the focus of your practice. If you believe it's simply a matter of accepting what's there as a given that you can't change, that totally changes the way you practice. Or if you believe that everything is predetermined. And I'm always shocked to find the number of Buddhist writers and Buddhist magazines that propose this as a somehow a Buddhist idea that the past totally shapes the present moment. You have no choices at all. If you had no choice, why would you be sitting here meditating? Well, it just happened to be because your past causes, or the, the way the universe works itself out, has you sitting here. But there's no sense of you're doing anything and what you can do to shape things. So the implications of the Buddha's way can really do focus right in on how you meditate, how you practice. And they give you the energy, they give you the sustenance, the sustaining power 
to stick with the practice even in difficult times, because you realize that if you do it well, you don't have to suffer from those difficulties, and that the rewards are great. It's not just a nice way to pass your time until you die and then that's it. There are long-term consequences that go beyond the end of the body. And you can choose what you're going to do, and you can shape the extent to which you're suffering right now. You can shape the extent to which you're clinging, to which you're limited. by the results of past actions. So this quality of faith, conviction in the Buddha's awakening, is an important element in keeping you focused on where the important issues are in your life right now, where the important issues in your practice are right now. So that you can take advantage of this opportunity really to find what freedom is like. So it's good to contemplate on these things, especially when the, the going gets rough. There may be some roughness coming in from your past karma, but you don't have to suffer from it. You have some choices in the present moment how you're going to shape those potentials coming in from the past. So keep these points in mind, because they give the energy, even when things seem to be closing in on you. There is an escape. There is an opening. Freedom is possible. And the quality of the mind is much more important than the mere survival of the body helps you keep your values straight. So even if you don't get all the way to true freedom this time around, the effort you've put into the practice is not wasted. <laughs>